Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to our friends who are joining us online. We hope everyone is doing well. Please let us know where you're joining us from and if you have any prayer concerns. A few announcements before we begin our service today. Our newsletter just came out. If you get a chance, you could pick a copy up as you enter or leave the sanctuary and you would have received also one uh, if you are on our email list. Um, I want to highlight the uh, latest outreach effort. Uh, the WSU, the Cougar Cupboard is the food pantry for students and we have a little information there for you. This food pantry is available to students who help, um, it helps them if they need groceries, it's right there on campus for them and they can just come in and um, reach whatever they need in, uh, in no time at all. They don't have to drive to the food pantry and anywhere else. So we ask you to help us stock that food pantry and there's information there about what we need. Non-perishable foods, no glass items, toiletries, baby items, and there are other, there's more information if you would like to go on their website, but Quick snacks like granola bars and crackers, uh, dairy-free milk, which, which is shelf-stable, and so forth. So if you need more information, contact Toma in the office. Her cousin works at, uh, at the Cougar Cupboard, and there's a picture of her on the internet. So uh, if you could ask Toma anything, and she'll ask her cousin if you have questions. So. Um, other announcements, we have Monday, Thursday, week after next, and if you would like to join us for that service, we have a sign-up sheet outside, again, in the Narthex sign-up. We need to know how many people will be here for that service, uh, for the soup supper before the service, so we can have enough uh, food for everyone. We are hosting Shalom United Church of Christ, so uh, I would hope that people will come out for that and be good hospitality bearers for our friends at Shalom. If you have any questions, Sue Jewett is spearheading the hospitality and Donna Whiteside, or you can call the church office. Speaking of church office, our internet is down, so tomorrow I may be working from home, but you can reach me on my cell phone if you need me. Same with Toma. We can't do anything without internet. I know, friends, we're there in this, this day and age. If you don't have internet, you can't do anything. We can't even print. So um, we are trying to deal with this. The Spectrum, Charter, whatever the company is, their modem is what needs to be changed. So hopefully we can uh, have that all fixed tomorrow. Whew, okay, that was a lot of stuff. So let's get down to business. This is why we're here. We're here to worship the Lord. <laughs> Because this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship the Lord. On this cool Sunday morning outside, we're glad to be, get, to be together in this warm place to worship. Please join me. Let us praise the God who formed the mountains and created the wind. Let us sing to the one who made the stars. Who turns deep darkness into morning and day into night. Let us turn to God, hating what is evil and loving what is just. May justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And if you are able to stand, we will join together in singing, O God, our vision.
Creator God, you have given us the power of imagination through which the future grasps our lives today. We confess that we do not give our lives over to the transforming power of your spirit. We choose not to hear you calling to us. We deny the gifts you grant us. We fail to live in ways that build up the life of your whole creation. Forgive us and give us courage that we may open ourselves to the new creation you seek to bring within and among us. Draw us into the future toward the new world you are creating through the grace of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hear these words of assurance of pardon. While it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Let us join in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now is springing forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me and jackals and ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. In the musical Fiddler on the Roof, the main character, Tebye, is his name, lives in a little village. And in this little village, everyone knows their place, everyone knows their role, exactly what they need to do. It's the way they live, the only way they know how to. Now it's 1905, and it's the beginning of the Russian Revolution, and the Tsar is evicting Jews from their homes. That's the backdrop to this story. The story centers around Tevye, his Jewish father, and the challenges that he undergoes as three of his five daughters and their choices begin to unravel his religious traditions and his beliefs. So the characters in this musical look back to their history, they look back to tradition to find their roles and their identity. Nothing is new, nothing is unexpected. And as Tevye sings in the opening song, because of our tradition, everyone knows who he is and what God expects him to do. Tradition. And if you haven't watched this musical, do because it's a lovely story, and you'll know that tradition. I can't sing, I wish I could. <laughs> but he just does his dance, his joyous dance around tradition. And he says, without our traditions, our lives would be as shaky as a fiddler on the roof. Now, unfortunately for Tevye and his family and his little village, the changes that are thrown at them by by political unrest, by revolution, by regime changes, and, and the impact of the Industrial Revolution in the early 1900s, all this, all this unbalances their precarious dance of tradition and life. And unlike the fiddler on the roof who can actually play and dance at the same time on a roof, Tevye, and those other characters, not so much. They can't maintain their balance, and, and their lives begin to change in unexpected ways. So now let's talk about the Bible and the people of Israel during the time of the prophet Isaiah. We have a little bit of that same scenario going on. There's experiences that they've clung to, and ancient Israel's life were determined and their identity was formed around two important events in the Old Testament. We have the Exodus and we have the exile. And tradition demanded that the Exodus especially be remembered. And that ongoing recitation of Israel's emancipation from slavery in Egypt was and still is at the core of the yearly Passover celebration. Israel defined itself by that one event. It was the event that actually created them as a nation as they left Egypt. It was out of this central event that God called them forward into a new land and into a new way of life. Now moving forward several hundred years to the time of the prophet Isaiah, and several kings 
later, several generations removed from the Exodus event, we find that Israel is still reciting the tradition and is now giving lip service to that tradition, but somehow the point of their history is missed. They recite the words, they say the right things, but the meaning and the meaning behind the memories is hollowed out. So prophets like Isaiah are calling out, are calling out the social injustices of the self-serving rich rulers, of the elite class, and prophets like Isaiah are reminding the kings and those that held power that they were all once slaves in Egypt. It seems that that has been forgotten, even though they recite the story. <coughs> so it seems that the oppressed now become the oppressors of their own people. And that's the background for today's scripture from Isaiah. That 43rd chapter of Isaiah begins with a promise of restoration. And it begins with this promise of protection after the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. That's the exile period. And in verses 16 through 21, Isaiah, who's Trying to comfort Israel reminds people that God is the Holy One, the creator of Israel. And Isaiah then continues the proclamation by reminding the people of Exodus, of the Exodus event, and once again turns to tradition as that defining moment as the, the giver of identity and order for the people of Israel. But then, but then the unexpected happens. And Isaiah, speaking for God in verse 18, says, Do not remember the former things. Do not consider the things of old. Wait a minute. This sudden reversal to forget the former things is a, is a break. Is a break with a very formative event of Israel. How can they forget that very event that created their nation? And why is God telling them through Isaiah to forget the past? That's the question. Now, remembering the past is not a bad thing. And traditions are fun. And they help us create memories. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But when tradition becomes empty, when traditions become empty, they are useless. And when the repetition of our traditions erases the meaning of that very act itself, we have nothing left. And we need to reconsider why. Why are we cling to, clinging to that tradition? I once heard a, part, a funny story that I will share with you to kind of help make this point. So a woman who prepared ham every holiday would purchase a whole ham. You, maybe you know this story. And she would prepare the ham by cutting off each side of the ham, and then she would bake it, never really thinking much about that process. Until one year, her daughter, who was learning how to cook and wanted to know about this holiday ham process, she asked her mother, Mom, why do you cut off the sides of the ham? The mom shrugged her shoulders, and she replied to her daughter, because, well, that's how grandma always made the ham, and that's how I learned. And it was very delicious. So later at the dinner table, the daughter turns to her grandma and says, Grandma, why did you always cut the ends off the ham when you used to make ham? And then the grandma replied that, well, um, her mother had always done it that way, and and she learned from her mother, and it was delicious. So she repeated that process. And around that time, great-grandma, who is sitting at the end of the table, begins to chuckle. <laughs> great-grandma begins to chuckle, and all three women, the daughter, the mother, and the grandma, turn to her and say, great-grandma, oh, what's so funny? And she replies, I cut the sides off of the ham because I didn't have a 
pan large enough to bake the entire ham. So while there is nothing wrong with the tradition, this humorous story reminds us that sometimes we might want to look at why we do what we do. There's nothing wrong with tradition and remembering. We all have wonderful memories of the past. But as Isaiah is warning the people of Israel, it's when we, when we get stuck in the past, when we're surrounded with our nostalgia, when, when we forget why we do the things we do, well, that's when we're no longer alive in our faith. That's when we're no longer unwilling to see that new thing that God is doing. But fortunately, God is a God of vision. God is a God that creates new streams in the desert. And God is a God that does unexpected things and uses unexpected people throughout history. And we see that in the Bible over and over. Remember Sarah. Sarah wasn't expected to have children, yet in her old age she became the mother of Isaac. And David. David was a small shepherd boy, the youngest of many sons, and he wasn't supposed to become king, and yet he did. And not just any king, he was a great king. And Mary. Mary, an unwed pregnant teen, became the mother of Jesus. And the most unexpected gift of all, Jesus, Jesus himself, Jesus who redefined this concept of Messiah, the anointed one. And now redefined it to mean Messiah, the servant, the one who came to serve, not to be served. Jesus, who came to show us a new way, who taught us that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, that we should love our enemies, and that we should show others mercy and justice and kindness. And we know that in Jesus Christ, God has given us this fresh new start. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It seems that that's a recurring theme in our biblical witness. And our faith in God is that anchor. The anchor that we need as we discover what that new thing that God is doing for us. I'm about to do a new thing God is saying for us today. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? Now in Isaiah's vision, God promises to make a way in the wilderness. And God is then inviting us to experience that new thing. But you know what? We can't see that new thing if we aren't willing to see that new thing. We can't see that new thing if we are clinging to past memories and traditions. Now I know we've all experienced change. <laughs> you know how it feels, right? It, it feels like you're unbalanced. Maybe you're that fiddler on the roof trying to play and dance. And maybe you're still struggling with changes, unexpected changes. And that's all right. I think it's okay to confess that we might have PTSD from COVID. I know there are moments I wake up and I say, has it been two years? Where did that time go? Change is difficult, but often necessary. And we have to be courageous and understand that there's no... Nothing wrong with change. Actually, change is the only constant. And it's sometimes difficult to imagine things being different than they are. But if we look around outside our circles, we see that change is already happening. It's already happening. And we just need to see it. The church is changing. And that's church with capital C. That's every church not just us. 
Church is changing. The way people worship or don't worship is changing. Society is changing. Institutions are changing. If you belong to different clubs, you know they are changing. And God is telling us that God is doing a new thing. And it's at this point that I sigh and I do my eye roll and I say, God, I don't see it. What is this new thing you are doing? And it would help if you could just clue me in. <laughs> I'm ready, God. I have to admit, I'm just going to admit that I struggle to, to offer an illustration of, of that new thing that God is doing in the world. And I have to admit that it seems that for me, it's the bad news that I hear. It's, it's the bad news that I hear and kind of go to. It's called doom scrolling, if you want to know. But if I turn away from that constant news stream and I just look out the window and I can see that flowers are springing up and those once dormant bulbs are starting to pop up and then it's calling me to a sense, maybe a naive hope if you will, that God is doing a new thing. God can do new things with my life, with your life, with our church, with the world. We might not be able to perceive it right now, but God is doing it now. And it's up to us to plug in to God so we can perceive it. And maybe, maybe in order to perceive that new thing that God is doing, we need to let go of the past. And also that constant monitoring of the present, those bad things that are happening, the obsession to read the latest news, the latest breaking headline, the latest catastrophic event. I know that's true for me. And I know, I know that it's true that when I am overwhelmed by my, what life throws at me and what the world is throwing my way, I just can't see that new thing that God has promised. Yet I know that God has promised a new thing, but but I can't see it. And I am blinded. I am blinded to new possibilities because of my focus on, on the negativity around me. So I might not have an illustration for you, but I want to end with this poem because I turn to poetry when I can't find the words that I need to express something. Poets express it for me. And the poet Wendell Berry expresses this idea that sometimes we are thrown off balance by changes in our life. And sometimes we, do, we need to just be. And here's this poem, The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron sees. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and then free. Friends, memories of our past and despair for our present may be hindering our ability to perceive that new thing that God is doing. But let us remain open to that movement of God's spirit among us as God does something new in our lives and in our church, and in our world. Amen.
Pastor Miriam referenced the story of the Exodus, and I'm reminded as I think about our invitation to share our gifts and to give, that in so many ways that Exodus story began with Moses, who gets a call from God and says, but God, I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue, and there's no way I have the gifts to do what it is that you envision. And yet Moses acts with a lot of encouragement from God and some proofs and whatnot, but steps forward into what becomes the vision and what becomes the tradition and what becomes the Exodus story that anchors our faith far into the future. And another, however many hundreds of years later, the disciples in the gospel watch Jesus crucified and think that their story is over, that think without him we don't have... Um, that they lack the gifts to bring the church forward, and yet this new vision of what God is doing becomes clear on Easter morning, which we approach, this new vision of resurrection, and from this motley crew of disciples comes the church that we have today. And so as I sit in my own moment and think about what it means to sometimes see the wilderness around us, I'm reminded that our slow of speech, slow of tongue, little table in the upper room is in fact the gifts, the time, the talents for which God makes all things new. And so we're invited to give of our dollars, of our time. We're invited to give to students, to refugees, to this congregation. We're invited to give knowing that however small we may feel, that a great big new thing is being made in this moment by God. So let us pray. These, your gifts, O oh Lord, are returned for glory. So bless us with wisdom to use all of our gifts as you would have us do. Bless us with your vision. Bless us with trust. Bless us and our lives with courage to do your bidding. Through Christ our Lord, who makes all things new. Amen. And 
so together we partake of the bread. And the cup of salvation. Strengthen you in every way, now and forevermore. 